got to stand real quick for me, please. All right, so we got another general of the army coming up this morning. You guys ready to receive this word from the Lord this morning? So if you guys would, welcome up our senior pastor, Pastor Tony Sanders. Hallelujah. Can y'all hear me out there? Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Y'all sound like y'all ready. Well, let's not delay. Let's go to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. How many people are excited about the word of God? One word from God can completely change your life. 2 Timothy 3. Can you guys put it up on the screen? We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Verse 1. This, also, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, Incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Come on. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you uh, this morning for the awesome opportunity to minister your word to your people. And Lord, I ask that you will give me the words of wisdom, the words of knowledge, the words of understanding. Father God, that you will give me utterance to open my mouth boldly and speak as you would want me to speak. Lord, I pray that this morning, dear people, will hear your voice in my voice. Father God, use the word this morning to speak into people's lives, speak into their situations, speak into their circumstances. Lord, let it not just be information, but let it be an impartation of your spirit. So, Father God, we can not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Holy Spirit, have your way. I thank you for what you're going to do in advance in Jesus' mighty name. If you can believe it, say amen. amen. I want to minister tonight on the topic, let love flow. Let love flow. God has still got me ministering um, on this topic. He really wants me to minister it uh, to this body that we begin to operate and function in the love of Almighty God. We talked about last week how God's love is different from uh, human love. God's love is unconditional. It's truly love that's not based on anything that you can reciprocate back to it. God is love. So listen, he's made a decision to love you no matter what. He loves you in the hog pen. He loves you when you're in the palace. He loves you when you're doing good. He loves you when you're not doing good. You can count on the love of God that is never, ever going to change on you. But listen, it's not good enough for God to just have love. He wants us to be vessels of his love to get his love flowing in this earth. That scripture that I opened up with, as you begin to read it, I, I was meditating on it, and I said, Lord, it says perilous times in the last days. I said, my God, if that's not a picture of the world that we live in, and it's a picture of a world without love. And God is saying, listen, despite the condition of the world is in, the condition of my church will override the condition of the world. And I've called you to be, listen, world changers. I called you to be the salt of the earth. I called you to bring the flavor into planet earth that even though the earth is cold, that when you st show up, you can be vessels that my love can begin to flow into this earth so I can save the world. The Bible says in John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those that believe in him should be saved and not condemned. Listen, God does not hate the world. God loves the world. God wants the world to be saved. So listen, never get it wrong. Listen, we're supposed to be uh, uh, demonstrators of the love that God showed through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus was the ultimate manifestation of the love of God. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express 
image of his person. In John 14, 8, Philip said to the Lord, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus replied, have I been with you so long and you have not known me? He that has seen me has seen the Father also. Notice Jesus didn't pull out his wallet and show him a picture of the Father. He didn't pull out his cell phone and hit the gallery button to show a picture of the Father. He said, no, look on me and I'm just like the Father. I came out of the Father. I am the express image of God the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now this was refreshing in the time of Jesus because the concept of God that was portrayed by the Pharisees was a God of wrath that a God God, if you didn't obey the rules, that condemnation and judgment was going to come upon your life. And Jesus said, listen, I am the opposite of how I've been portrayed. And if you listen, the Father of God looks just like me. So if you want to know your heavenly father, take a fresh journey through the gospels, through Matthew, Luke and John and see how Jesus operated. And you get a glimpse of how your heavenly father really is, not how religion sold it to you, not how your grandmother gave it to you. Listen, just like how it is in reality. Yeah. Come on. Look at your neighbor and say, I got to know this God for myself. Show us the Father. Sometimes the things we are asking for have been staring us right in the face. There is hidden potential all around you. We just have to recognize it and draw it out. So Jesus was the word of God made flesh. John 1.14 said, and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the glory of God. Glory, I looked that word up, it means brightness, splendor, magnificence, visible splendor. The glory of a rose is not the stem of a rose. It's the red petals that draw your attention. The petals are the glory of the rose. It's the highlight of the plant. You buy them because of the red petals, not because of the green stem. And listen, Jesus was the glory of Almighty God. And listen, just like a rose attracts you to buy, buy it because of the red petals. So listen, our Christianity is displayed through the loving kindness of Jesus. That people are, are going to be attracted to Christianity, not because of the wrath of God, not because of the law of God, but because of the kindness, yeah. the brightness, yeah. the love, the majestic Jesus. Yeah. That's why the Bible says that he is the rose of Sharon. Yeah. That listen, I'm a rose. I'm not the stem. Jesus said, I am the rose. When you look on me, you should have be attracted to me and when people look on us they should be attracted to the God that we say that we serve we should not be repelling people people should want to come into the kingdom because we demonstrate the love kindness mercy grace and love of almighty God I don't want no God that's going to beat me up I want a God that's going to love me unconditionally. Even when I blow it, even when it's good, I want an unconditional loving God. That's the difference between our God and other world religions. Every other world religion is based on what you can do to be approved by God. Can I tell you something? You already been approved over 2,000 years ago. Jesus approved you at Calvary. You're approved by God. When Moses asked the Lord, show him the glory. Notice God said, okay, I will make all my goodness pass by. Notice God didn't say, okay, I'll show you my glory. I split a Red Sea. I'll show you how I made a star. I show you how I allow the ocean to come but so far and go right back out. I'll show you uh, uh, the Milky Way galaxy. 
Surely that would be the glory of God. God said, that's not my glory. That's good, but that's not my glory. My glory is my goodness. My glory is my loving kindness. As I was meditating on this, I don't know if anybody ever seen this, but the Bible says that when he asked them to show him the glory, that he took Moses in the cleft of a rock. And then he said, you can't see me. But listen to this. He said, all you can see is my back. And I began to meditate on the back. And then I began to come be illuminated into what happened at Calvary. How Jesus was scourged on his back. Where he was whipped and beating. And by the stripes of Jesus that was on his back. You are here. I believe that God, because the glory he asked to see the glory and Jesus is, is, the, is the glory that he had to see Jesus. So what was it about the back? It was the back of Jesus at Calvary. Moses seen a glimpse. And see, you can't see my face, but you can see my back. And God showed Jesus his back. I will make all my goodness pass before you. God's glory is his goodness. He said, it's not good enough for me just to say I'm good. I got to show you I'm good. And I'm going to send my glory into planet earth. And his name is Jesus. It's the thing that draws your attention to him. It's the, re it's the reason why people buy into the things of God. The Bible says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. When you realize how good he is, you don't want to live without him. What, without him. You want to live for him. That's why people standing on the side of the road with a sign saying, repent or you're going to hell is not the glory of God. It's not. It does not attract. It repels, even though what they're saying is the truth. But it's not attractive because it's not wrapped in glory. The Bible says that Jesus came in grace and truth. I'm not just going to tell you the truth. I'm going to wrap it with my grace. I'm going to empower you to walk out my truth. I'm not going to put a law on you that you cannot do in your own strength. I'm going to give you the power to walk this thing out so you don't get discouraged. The goodness of God leads a man to repentance. The Pharisees did not reflect God's glory, even though they had the truth. They didn't have glory, so they never attracted anyone. You ever notice that about the Pharisees? They had the law, the truth of the word of God, but it created a divide between them and the very people that God wanted to say because it was the truth with no grace, no mercy, no understanding. And instead of unifying, it actually made a barricade between God and his creation. They did not reflect it. They never attracted anyone. And when they saw the Rose of Sharon show up, they got mad trying to figure out why everyone was attracted to this new preacher named Jesus. Because he was full of grace and truth and the goodness flowing out of Jesus attracted people to the Lord. And they could not figure it out. He don't even dress like us. He got the whole crowds following him. Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power who went around doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So Jesus was a dispenser of the goodness of almighty God. Love just flowed out of him. No matter what the Pharisees did to him, no matter what the accusations was against him, he never let anything 
Let the love flow out of him. He kept letting love flow out. Even when people were, were, were he had disciples waking him up. Lord, help us. My God, when you guys going to get it? Peace, be still. I will still demonstrate my love. The love of God flowed out of him. But listen to this. But now Jesus is in heaven. But at the same time, we are still connected to him. In Colossians 1.18, the Bible says that he is the head of his body, which is the church. 1 Corinthians 12.27 says, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. His body is the church. That means that you and me are his body. He is the head of the body. The body is what is seen on planet Earth. So Jesus, one man, dispensing love through salvation has multiplied himself and made many members and created the body of Christ. He said, it's better that I go away because if I don't go away, the Father's not going to send the comforter. And if for me, it's about multiplication because I can only be in one place at one time. But when I go away, the one that's in everywhere at the same time, omnipresence, all-knowing, is going to come and fill you and empower you. And then I'm going to create the body of Christ. You and me are his body. Touch yourself. I'm part of the body. That's why we got to start treating each other better. Because we're all a part of the body of Christ. Now, we think it's abuse when we see somebody hurting themselves. So when you hurt your brother or sister, you're actually hurting yourself. You're actually hurting Jesus. Listen, Jesus takes it personally what happens to his body. When Paul formerly Saul was persecuting the church, he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus. And listen to what Jesus said to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Wait a minute. Jesus was in heaven. But his body was being persecuted on the earth. And Jesus knocked Saul off his horse and said, why are you persecuting me? Jesus takes it personally what happens to you and me. I don't know who's messing with you. I don't know who's persecuting you. God always gives a window for people to turn around. But just like the Apostle Paul, eventually Jesus had to get involved. Now, I hear some of y'all get him, Jesus. But listen, Jesus' judgment is conversion. Amen. Vengeance is, is the Lord's. God's vengeance is converting the, the Saul to be Paul, to be the one, to be the apostle that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, to take an ugly and make it good. To make some that was glory and give it glory. That's God's judgment. I'm going to convert you. You keep messing with my children. I'm going to save you. I'm going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to transform your mind. God's judgment is conversion. Because it's not the will of God that any man perish. That all would be saved, even the ones that are acting ugly. Amen. When you mess with the body, you're messing with Jesus. Yeah. Jesus didn't destroy Paul. He converted Paul. God's glory is his goodness, not his wrath. Look at your name and say, God doesn't have death row. God has a life role. Now, in, in the legal system, he should have been killed. 
But God said, listen, I got to demonstrate my glory. And instead of death row, Paul, you get in life row. You know, there's many people that were on death row that gave their lives to, to the Lord during that time. And they went from death row to life row. Why would God do that? Well, we all deserve death row. But God gave us all life row. Because we measure stuff. Well, that was a big thing. What I'm doing is little. If you want, if Jesus wants to show himself strong on this planet, it's going to be through us. Through his sons and daughters, we are dispensers of his love. In Romans 8, 16, in the Passion, the entire universe is standing on tiptoes, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. There is a flow God wants us to dispense, and it is the flow of, your, of love. Tell your neighbor, let love flow. Let love. Why? Remember I said last week that we think of love and we think of this, this just this goosey feeling thing. And I tell you guys, I realize that love is actually leading us to our own personal cross to die to self. Because when God asks you to forgive and your flesh don't want to forgive, you got to die to self to be able to do that. When God says, bless those that persecute you and despitefully use you, you got to die to self to fulfill that word. So God's love, like it led Jesus to the cross, love is leading you to your cross for you to die to yourself. Oh, God, forgive. Oh, God, give them money. Look what they just said to me. Oh, God, what? They stabbed me in the back. Bless them. Forgive them. Release them. I'm trying to convert them. I'm trying to save them. And it's going to be love that's going to get the job done. Somebody say, let love flow. I was talking to somebody this uh, week, and they were telling, sharing me the story about Smith Wigglesworth, great evangelist of our time. But one of the things that doesn't get talked about a lot is his wife. So I did a little research, and I wanted to know about this wife that demonstrated the unconditional love of God. Now, the wife was saved before Smith Wigglesworth was. So she was married to an unbeliever, but nonetheless, you know what the Bible says? That the, un, the, the believing wife sanctifies the unbelieving husband. And the believing husband sanctifies the unbelieving wife. God said, just put them over here. Set them apart. Because there's a time and a season. I'm going to get them. Listen to this. A few years ago, he told this story. Smith Wigglesworth's wife was saved before he was. She would go to church, and of course he would never attend and often be very rude to her because of it. One evening, she went for a church service, and when she came home, he had locked her out of the house. Yes, on purpose. Instead of getting mad, banging on the door, throwing rocks at the window, Mrs. Wigglesworth laid down on the porch and went to sleep. I was like, wow. I know some ladies would have threw a rock through the window, kicked the door down, called the police, called their, their older brother. I mean, just crazy stuff that goes through our minds when people do something wrong to us. <laughs> Instead of getting mad, banging on the door, Throwing rocks, Mrs. Wigglesworth laid down on the porch and went to sleep. Every morning, Smith would go outside to retrieve the, pa the newspaper before breakfast. As he opened the door to go outside, there his wife stood, paper in hand, and she said, Good morning, Smith. Here's your paper. 
how did you sleep? And what would you like me to cook for you for breakfast? Holy getting your attention. Holy putting question marks in you. Holy questioning oh, you, her whole church philosophy. That demon, it wasn't her going to church. It was the demonstration of love that got his attention. I want to go to no church? Show me the church. Miss Wiggleworth showed unconditional love. As most of you know, her husband went on to get saved and become one of the great evangelists with a remarkable healing ministry worldwide. How many times do we just want to put people in their place? How many times do we want to share our side of the story? How many times do we want to avenge ourselves, get revenge, or simply just let people know how we feel? You know, she could have let them know how she felt. She, she, she didn't even put her feelings in the equation. You know it was cold out here? You know that mosquitoes bit me? And, and I got this bed and you left me out here? How could you do this to me? She didn't even put herself in the equation. She said, you know what? It ain't about me. It's about love. And I got to show this man that the God I serve is real. And he's not going to know he's real because he's not coming to church. So I'm going to have to show him right in his face that Jesus is real. Amen. That no matter what you do to me, you're not going to change me. Let me say something. You know, we go through a lot in life. And I had somebody tell me this in one of the seasons I was going through a lot. They said to me, Pastor Tone, listen, please don't change who you are. I see what you're going through. I see what they're saying, but don't let it change you from who you are. If, you be, if, if they're treating you with bitterness, don't get bitter. If they're treating you with anger, don't be angry. If they're treating you with unkindness, don't become an I unkind person. Don't become what you're going through. Get better, not bitter. And a lot of times life throws things at us and we become what we're going through. You know, when you see somebody, they they're just look uh, rough. I can look at them and tell they went through a lot in their life. I don't condemn them. I don't judge them. But I can tell that they have become what they went through. You know, there's some people in here right now and you see them walking around smiling. But if you, they told you their testimony and what they went through in life, you'll scratch your head wondering I would have never known that. Because you don't look like what you went through. I can go through it, but I don't have to look like it. I can go through hell, but I don't have to become hell. People can release hell on me, but I don't have to be a hell raiser. And a lot of us are victims to what we went through. Not that you did any wrong, but because what happened to you, you built this thing around you where you won't let love flow anymore because you don't trust anybody. And we build barricades around my life. And on the barricades, if it had a, 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 a sign on it, it would say, nobody's going to hurt me anymore. And God is saying it's time for the walls of Jericho to come down on your love life. Let the walls down. It's time to love. It's time to live again. It's time to feel again. I've been there. Walls built up. Nobody's going to hurt me again. You're only getting this far. I'm not going to open up my heart to you. Because you're going you're gonna to destroy. You're going to be like those, those people from the past. Can I say something? Those people in the past are gone. Yeah. It's a new day. It's a new season. Yeah. It's a new people. Sure, you still might get hurt. But that's all right. God will heal your broken heart. And God will, listen, set you free to love yeah. unconditionally. Yeah. No matter what. Yeah. 
The same spirit that allowed Jesus to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. is the same spirit that lives on the inside of you. You can say it to Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The Bible says they will know us by our love. It says that love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long suffering. It says that without love, we have nothing. It even says that God is love. Therefore, if God is love, then we should choose. Then we should choose to love. When we don't love, we display Satan rather than God. How many wives could do that? Could still love despite being done that wrong? Look at your name and say, that was dirty. I mean, that was like, that was from the devil himself. But listen, sometimes we got to realize we're in a spiritual battle. And people talk about spiritual warfare. But spiritual warfare is sometimes won, the battle is won by you acting like Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I cast that spirit out. Sometimes it don't take all of that. Sometimes it takes you just being kind instead of getting ugly. That's spiritual warfare. The Bible says we overcome evil with good. Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. The devil has already been defeated. In the name of Jesus, get out. Done. What's next? Call a prayer meeting and cast the devil out. You don't know your authority. Jesus said, all power has been given to me in heaven and earth, and I have given it to you. I, the same authority that I have, you have. Use it. Come on. I think some of us are too devil-minded. We see a devil everywhere. Devil behind every Devil, 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 devil. Sometimes it's flesh. Ain't nothing the devil's like, man, I get blamed for everything. <laughs> My God, I ain't doing all that craziness. Even the devil said, I, that, that ain't all me. <laughs> That's just some people in their brain right. with an unrenewed mind. Yeah. It's not all the devil. I <laughs> will get blamed for everything. This wife made a decision. Nobody, look at your neighbor and say, nobody, nobody. is going to stop me from being like Jesus. God used the love of a wife to convert one of the greatest miracle workers of our generation. When life happens to us, the enemy is banking on us reacting in the flesh. I thought of the story of Joseph and how the ugliness his brothers did to him. He had a dream, for those that don't know the story, and he made the mistake of sharing his dream with everybody. Look at your name, said, don't share with everybody. Anyway, his brothers got jealous, envious of him, and they decided to kill him. They were actually in their mind wanted to kill their own brother because of jealousy and envy. But the Lord spared Joseph and did not allow that to happen anyway. He was brought to Egypt and was uh, accused. He was in prison. He was a slave. He was all this bad stuff that happened because of what his own family put him through. I mean, people can do you wrong, but when your family does you wrong, I think it hurts a little bit more. I think it goes a little bit deeper. But I love Joseph. He didn't get bitter. He got better. He held on to the dream. He didn't become what he went through. He stayed sweet. He stayed obedient to God. He served God. He held on to the dream and did not get offended at what life had thrown at him. The, the hand that was dealt to him by life, he didn't say, oh, I don't want this hand. 
I got a wrong deal. I got a wrong hand. And Joseph said in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. My God. You intended it to harm me. You intended it to hurt me. You intended it to stab me in the back. You intended it for me to throw in the towel. You intended it for me to give up, cave in, and quit on my dream. But God turned it around for the good. You see, Satan's wrongs and evil can't wipe out the goodness of God. You see, on the contrary, God's goodness shows up in our life to erase the evil that was done to us and turn it all around for the good. And Joseph, standing in the fulfillment of his dream and his vision, was staring the ones that, that meant evil to him right in the face. And they did not recognize him. They did not understand, but he knew them. And he could have, listen, his position, he could have cleaned house. And Joseph said, you know what? I choose to be better. I choose to look at the big picture. And you meant it for evil, but God allowed it for me to actually save you. And Joseph let love flow into his family into the nation of Israel. He didn't get bitter at his father. He didn't get bitter at his brother. He allowed love to flow. He is one of the greatest examples of forgiveness in the Bible because you got a guy with power now that could have really did some damage and chose not to do that, but to display the goodness and the glory of God. And God is saying, that's what I want you to do. How many of us Sometimes are under somebody and they do us bad. Then the script, the, the script is flipped. And now you got an opportunity to do the right thing. And God is looking at you to see if you're going to forgive, to see if you're going to act ugly like you were done ugly. He wants to see, are you still going to be a vessel of his love and his goodness when he flips the script? Some of y'all wondering why the the script ain't been flipped because God knows what you're going to do when he flips it. You're going to return evil. Wait till I get in that position. I'm going to let them have it. It ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. You know who God puts in position? People that know how to love. People that are fair. People that are not biased. People that are equal. People that understand God. Can't give you all that power. You don't understand how I deal with people. You'll become a wrecking ball and destroy what I'm trying to build up. I was sharing with my daughter. We were driving in the other day. I said, listen, God is not like how the world says he is. Because if he was the way the world says he is, he would have wiped this place out a long time ago. All the sin, all the stuff that's against the law of God, all this stuff right in the face of God, and God just stays silent. If he was like they say he is, we, we all be gone. He's not like that. He's good. He's merciful. He's gracious. He didn't get bitter. He was now in a position. He didn't return evil. He chose to be a dispenser of good to the very ones that tried to take him out. Now, that's power. So people talk about power, power to preach, power to cast out devils. How about power to love? Matter of fact, didn't Jesus say at the last days they're going to come to me? Lord, didn't we cast out devils in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? He's going to say bounce, beat it. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So you can operate in all that stuff and still miss God. Because God is love. I, I, I'm not like that. Don't let what you're going through change. You don't, don't give people that kind of power in your life. Stay sweet. Stay loving. Keep on smiling. Keep on being kind. 
Keep on being patient and let love flow. The enemy wants to block our love flow. To block a flow of water, it's going to take a dam. Somebody say a dam. a dam. Sweating it up up here. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Dam. A dam. A <laughs> dam. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I sweat for Jesus. Man, I used to drive around sweating, all high and out of my mind. And I sweat for Jesus helping people instead of sweat, sweating, destroying people. People be like, why are you sweating so much? It's what I was putting in my body. AC on 60 and still sweating. God, I don't know why I'm sweating. If something's going on. I need to go to the doctor. <laughs> yes. A dam, a barrier to obstruct the flow of water. Galatians 5, 6, that the Bible says that faith works by love. Your faith works in conjunction with your love walk. Could it be possible that our faith is not working because of our love walk? Could it be possible we are not seeing the manifestation of our faith? Because we are not walking in love. The enemy wants us to have faith, but a non-producing faith. Now, for the last few moments, let's talk about the dams. Somebody say the dams. The big one. What's that big dam out, in, out west? This is Hoover Dam. This is Hoover Dam right here. Here go Hoover Dam. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness, like Hoover Dam, holding back that mighty river, not letting love flow, keeping, keeping love capped over here, and everybody on this side is living in a dry and thirsty land with a lack of your love. Unforgiveness, not disposed to give or show mercy. Unrelenting, not allowing for mistakes, Carelessness or weaknesses. Now, we want God to be patient with us, right? Why are we not patient with one another? You made that mistake again. And you know their horse is not trying to do it on purpose. They just haven't mastered it yet. So God is saying, give them a break. Show some kindness. You didn't do everything right, and you're not doing everything right. And I don't let the hammer drop on you, so why don't you take it easy on people? Yes. And stop being an Egyptian taskmaster. They beat the children of Israel because they weren't fulfilling the quotas. And God is saying, that's not the spirit I want in my church. Work with people. Be patient with people. Be kind with people. Operate with them how you want to be operated. I tell my kids all, all the time, how you want to be treated, treat other people that way. Because the seed you sow is the seed that's coming back on you. That's why I have a lot of problems with people. Because I tr really endeavor to treat people right, in love, in kindness. That's why I'm not in no clique. Because cliques divide and separate and they, they become prejudiced to other groups. And sometimes you can have a clique right in the church. I ain't with no clique. I'm everybody's friend. Click. Matter of fact, I said... I, I like walking by, a, a, I'm not insecure, I got to know what's going on with that group. Just whatever, I'm free. Free to be me. Free from the click. Not looking for man's approval, but God's approval. Man, what are they talking about me? Who cares? 
No weapon formed against you can prosper, and every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. You shall prove it false to be in the wrong. Don't matter if the whole plan is talking about you. God's got you covered. Don't worry about it. That's small thinking. It's kitty land. Kitty land. Mark eleven twenty five, 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any that your father, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Jesus said, listen, why are you up there asking me for some? Make sure you forgive your brother. Don't be asking me for nothing and you ain't forgive the, the brother or the sister that's right next to you. Matthew 8, 20, 18, 21 says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how many times will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And let it go. And the Amplified says, must I forgive him and let it go? Somebody say, let it go. Let it go. <laughs> Sometimes we become micromanagers of each other. <laughs> Do you know that um, as a leader, I'm not on a witch hunt? I don't go around. I'm, I'm, I'm positive. So I'm always looking for the good in things. Usually it's of a report. Somebody bought it to me or God, God brings it to me. This is going on. You need to know about it. But I'm not coming in here on a witch hunt That's right. That's right. looking for stuff. Because people that are on witch hunts don't let go what they get, what they find out. But listen, a lot of us need to let stuff go. Let it go. Stop holding stuff. You know what? It wasn't that big. In a year, we ain't even going to remember this. I'm just going to let this go. God is bigger than this. What God is doing in your life is bigger than this. What God is doing in my life is bigger than this. Let it go. It's not worth it. Let's let it go. Let love flow. Let the love flow. Let's let it go. But if you don't let it go, you created a dam and love can't flow. And God is saying, let it go. Stop being a nitpicking Christian. Let it go. Love covers a multitude of fault and sin. Love doesn't uncover. Love covers. I know some stuff, <laughs> but listen, I cover people. Let it go. Up to 70, seven times 70. 70 times seven, Jesus answered. So basically, Jesus said, Peter, there's no limit. He's trying to put a cap on his forgiveness. He's, he's asking Jesus, when can I put the dam back up? How many times do I have to forgive? And Jesus said, listen, no dams. It's always forgiveness. It's always forgiven. There's no limit to love. Of unforgiveness is a love blocker. Be quick to forgive. Next one. Bitterness. Bitterness can become a dam to block our love. When life is full of regrets and hurts, usually because we let it pile up on us, we hold on and, and are still holding on, and it creates bitterness. Bitterness. Bitterness is unresolved issues. You, you've been let down at life so many times, you begin to have a negative outlook on life, and it creates bitterness. And people suffer from that because you take out to somebody that's in your life for something that somebody did that was in your life that's not in your life anymore. And the new people got to put up with something that they didn't even do. And it usually stems from bitterness. Ladies, if you were in a bad relationship, don't take it on the, on, on the Boaz that God sends into your life. Guys, when, 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 when the Lord sends your Proverbs 30 woman, don't, don't, don't view her or treat her like those chicks from the past. Say, so you know what? This is a new day. This is a new season. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I can stay there, but we'll keep going. Let's, folk, let's, get, let's, let's bring the focus in a little clear. Offense. We get offended. Then when we get offended, we create a dam. Offense. 
When you get irritated, annoyed, anger, causing resentful displeasure in. Anybody ever been irritated at somebody? And you get offended at what somebody says and it creates an offense. There's an awesome book I'll call The Bait of Satan. Satan uses offense as a bait to get us into unforgiveness to stop the flow of God in our lives. Has someone got you offended? Offense will block the flow of God in your life. The only way to shake offense off is to forgive. When you are offended at someone, you begin to treat them differently. The love is not flowing towards them. You begin to give them the silent treatment. <laughs> Everything all right? Yep. You sure? Yep. Short answers. Avoiding any uh, interaction. It ain't short and sweet. It's short and bitter. <laughs> and what we're doing, we're saying, I, oh, there's a damn bill. You ain't getting this love. <laughs> the shop is closed down until further notice. What is it? You all right? I'm sleeping. The shop is closed down. That silent treatment is a killer. Sometimes you rather them just, just let it out. I'll take it. I'll take it like a man. Wait, 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 wait. Take it like this. Silent treatment, man. At least you know after that it's done. The silent treatment, you don't know, man, how long is this going to last? It's going to be uh, one day, two day. What's, what's, the, what's the sentence? Come on now. <laughs> I got the silent treatment. Oh, my God, I'm being held hostage, the silent treatment. Don't know what's going on. This is a damn blocker. Oh my God. When you are offended at someone, you begin to avoid them. They come your way, you go the other way. I don't feel like dealing with him. I don't feel like dealing with her. Your love flow is blocked, and you don't even realize it. Remember what I said it's bringing us to a cross? So those feelings are there? Do you know you have authority over your feelings? You know what? I don't feel like doing this. But to keep love flowing, to get rid of this offense, I'm going to go up and give him a hug. I love you. I bless you. And just the devil will be like, no! And the love, here come the love. <laughs> he gets washed away through the love flow. John 7, 38 says that he believeth on me. As the scripture have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Now the Lord told me to do an altar call. And sometimes he said that in my people's heart, they want to obey the word. They really want it. Tone, they, they want it. But sometimes there's stuff that's just on them that they really need to come into my presence. You know, the Bible says that the, 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 the mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. So there's sometimes there's stuff on us. And you know what? It's going to take God to get me to what he's talking about. And listen, I want to do an altar call now. And if you feel like you've been struggling in this love or this message ministered to you in any way, we, we're going to um, open up these altars. And listen, what an altar call is not so much uh, for you to have an encounter with me. 
is for you to have an encounter with God. This is the place where we give God time to move, time to touch, time to fill, time to touch people's lives. Amen? So, brother, let's put that song on for me. And as the music plays, come into the presence of your father. Come into the presence. Let's stand to our feet. Come into his presence. He wants to touch you. He wants to fresh you. He wants to uncap the dams. This morning, he wants to uncap the dams that were built up so love can flow. Unforgiveness can be broken. Offenses can be broken. Uh, being irritated can be broken. All those dams can be broken. Come now. Turn it up, sound. It's rocking. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. What's your mama have? 
What your daddy had, what your grandpa uncapped. and your grandma had, you don't uncapped. get to have. Uncapped, uncapped, remember, flow. If you have, if you have generational anxiety, depression, I want you to raise your hand. See the oil of heaven pouring out and it's flowing into your mind and it's literally filling in every crack every crevice it's flowing down into the deep deep parts he's speaking right to your heart and your children's children's children will not have anxiety and they will not have depression and they will not have the heaviness the cloud of heaviness we give you permission You gotta give him permission, I can't do it for you. I give you permission.
Glory. Hallelujah. God is a good God. Hallelujah. Now listen, you know, this word, you know, we're going to miss the mark, but there's no condemnation. Amen. Just get back up and get it right. Be quick to forgive. Oh, you know what? I shouldn't have said that. And just make it right. God looks upon our heart. Amen. Amen. And listen, let's let love flow this week like never before. The, the Lord showed me that, listen, this area that if we line up with it, it'll affect our relationships first, big. It's going to affect our health. It's going to affect our finances. It's going to affect every area of our lives. Remember what the commandment is. Love your neighbor as yourself. Deuteronomy 28 said, if you're obedient to the commandment of God, all these blessings will come upon you which is health, prosperity, all areas, it's all wrapped up in that commandment of love. So listen, as you're obedient to this, watch other areas of your life begin to break through things that were the enemy was using. as a, The dam in us blocks other stuff too. But when you get those dams out, God is able to bring them blessings into your life too. Amen? Amen. So glad to see my brother. Raise your hand, Ben Jimenez. Welcome home, brother. Graduate of the Faith Home. It's time, my brother. Welcome home, man. Amen. Amen. Let's lift our hands up to the Lord. Father, we just thank you this morning for your presence. We thank you, Lord, we'll never be the same. Father God, we thank you for taking us to new levels in love. And Father God, we know that it's not uh, 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 something we can't do. It is a grace to do it. So we receive that grace now in Jesus' name. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Amen. Be blessed, people.